control options. So we have a problem, what are we going to do about it? What's available to us? I'm going to go through these. Three. <coughs> Here's my mantra, it doesn't matter what you do, let's do the most good with these cards. Because whatever you decide to do, you are going to have a little bit of, or a lot. So you have to know what you're doing and, and do it the best way. This work is from Bert Glossy, looking at biological controls of Bert and his associates. They're the group that brought in the purple loose stripe beetle. So he's been researching possible uh, controls on frag mice for the last decade. And they, he's been in uh, uh, research collaboration with folks over in Europe. So they basically have it reduced to these two moths right here. They're stem borers, they'll go into the the leaf sh sh shoots and they'll, and they'll uh, eat away at them. Uh, just a little bit of background. In Europe, where, where Phragmites grows naturally, they've identified over 140 species that will target Phragmites. And of those, 40% are specific to that plant. Uh, Eastern seaboard of the U.S., they've identified 26 and all but five are introduced. Most of our invasive species come in along the, the, the seaboards. Um, so these were the two that were identified for potential biological control in, North, in, in the States and Canada, because they can't just release them down there without us being on board. What you need to know is these moths don't differentiate between invasive Phragmites and native Phragmites. And their argument is, well, without this control, you're going to lose your invasive Phragmites anyway. If you want to hear more about this, there's a really great webinar by Bert on the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative. There's actually quite a few webinars on there about Phragmites. Uh, this is why I don't think this is our silver bullet, and I don't think it's going to do the work that the uh, Purple Loose Strife Beetle is doing. This is a, a restoration project in the United Kingdom I came across. They called the uh, Phragmites uh, wetlands over there reed beds, high value ecosystems. Their wildlife have evolved for them. They're trying to restore this reed bed for the bittern and other species. And what I mean by restore is, if you leave Phragmites on its own for several hundreds of years, eventually it evolves into a thicket. It dries out the system and you go from the reed bed to woody species. So they're trying to set that back. They want to promote Phragmites. So how are they doing that? They're going in the winter and they're harvesting the standing dead material to get it out of there. They use this for thatching and all other kinds of, of, of viable products. So they're removing the standing dead, and then that gives room for the, the new shoots to come in and it keeps the water table down. And they're spending a lot of money doing this, by the way. I, I put uh, this in Canadian funds. So uh, the, machine, the machine itself is, um, where am I here? Uh, that's the cost of the machine right there, $140,000. And, and then there's so much to operate it per day and, and whatnot. <coughs> Here's the other reason I don't think biological controls are going to help us. I mentioned there's a 140 identified species that will target Phragmites. It is still considered a problem. It's, it grows in the same ecosystems we find it here. It's a malicious weed of agricultural crops. That's when all the checks and balances are in place. In Europe, this, I mentioned that reed beds are very high value ecosystems. They utilize these systems to put their cattle and sheep and goats out to feed in. They're heavily managed ecosystems. Uh, there's a lot of good nutrients in Phragmites, and it's, it's, it's been a common practice for a very long time. So people thought, well, let's try and bring some goats in to, to, to munch on Phrag and see how this goes. This was a, a landfill site that they're trying to restore uh, for, for uh, recreational use, so they brought the goats in. I don't think this is really a viable option for our customer. <laughs> what I do say to people is, if you want to educate folks, like if you have frag at the corner of a, have a big intersection or somewhere where you want to um, uh, educate, put a sign up, maybe put goats in a cage and, and have them that way. <laughs> when I see what happens with our native species that typically will clear out a, a cattail, monoculture, for instance, the, the muskrat. They do a great job of that, by the way. Uh, if you're walking through a wetland, you'll get to an area, you'll start to hear the birds, and you'll, you'll hear things popping in the water, and you know you're going to come to this opening. It's because the mu muskrats have cleared it open. And they have these channels going, so the fish can get in and out. And uh, the ducks will, will rest, and, and the turtles will loaf on these 
I have yet to see a really nice open area in Fred Muddy's supply muskrat. They just really don't like it. This, this poor muskrat is just eating out of living. You can just tell it just cut down barely enough to survive. And so Lynn Shore, who's going to be speaking to you this afternoon, she said to me, well, why don't we spray something over the plant so that, you know, make them want to eat it, kind of like, like a salad dressing. So I thought, that's my favorite. Oh, well, truly, uh, you're right. Uh, maybe that would work. I don't know. It's not been tried yet, but, I mean, there's lots of things we can be exploring, but we're not there yet. So let's go back to what they've been doing in the States and, uh, this is where I started. What are they doing in the U.S.? Because they've been fighting this plant a long time. Cutting, drowning. Uh, uh, in ducks and limited ponded areas or, or sites where they're impounded, a lot of the Americans have impounded coastal weapons so they can manipulate the water levels. So they can go in and they can raise the water levels for about uh, six feet, for six, a meter and a half for six weeks, and they can drown it out. We don't have that luxury, and I'm happy to say we have a lot of wetlands that are naturally um, in tune with our lake levels. So what I did, I went in and cut down the standing stalks in this 10 meter plot to see if we could drown it out, get rid of those straws, so that when the weather warms up in the spring, the oxygen can't diffuse through the stalks to the below ground structures. See if we can't drown them out. And in fact, it did work. Now what's coming in here are uh, from the parent stalks outside. They're started moving. So you have to be able to do this in the entire area you're working in, but it would work. Um, tarping, I have yet to hear where this has worked. Um, somebody in the audience may have tried this and it worked. On a small scale, it may be fine. What we tried at, at Kettle Point was putting up a, a, a frame so that uh, if it got wet underneath, they, the wildlife could, could use it. I don't recommend men this. The, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time and effort. And, and once you remove the, the tarp, um, the frag comes back. Cutting. Um, there's some situations where it would work. Uh, for the most part, what this gentleman's doing at Kettle Point is just clearing where we, where we couldn't spray along the, along the edge. Uh, this, this is going to grow back in. This area here, they went in with a mower because they could. And when I go back in there and I look, the, the native plants that are able now to come in because they're thinning it out, they are miniature because they're going in and mowing constantly. So they're impacting the native plants that are trying to come back. Also, they're opening up the habitat for the snakes and the toads and the frogs and the turtles. So when they go back in to mow, which they have to do, guess what they're harming? Actually, I spoke with a, there was a gentleman on, on Lake St. Clair that had a marsh. He went in with a, a big brush hog to clear the frag out of his coastal wetland. He decapitated a snapping turtle. He felt terrible about it. So there is harm. Um, this is very destructive. Some people that live on Lake Huron want their Bahama beach. They want the sand. They want, they want to be able to play and recreate. This uh, trailer park here trucked in sand over a, what should have been a beautiful cobble uh, wetland beach um, middle marsh, but they did that years ago and then the frag moved in so they started plowing and plowing and they get all the pe people from the trailer park to come in and pull up the rhizomes and they do this every year. This gentleman here, um, he has his little golf course uh, landscape grass and he's trying to extend it because this was a little lake here. This is his, this is his uh, property boundary here. So not easy not helping Lake Huron out at all, but um, guess what he's doing every weekend. <laughs> hey, um, so basically, if you if you cut the if you do the plowing, that's what you get. You just make the plant angry, so you just have to keep that. <laughs> burning it makes you feel really good if you can burn it, but you're just getting rid of the biomass, basically. Um, the frag quite likes it. To be <laughs> so back to that picture I showed you, where we've got the massive acreage of thick thick frag. What do we do? Chemical. Here I am, a wetland ecologist advocating chemical. My mother never thought I'd be doing this. I never thought I'd be doing this, but I am. If it's done responsibly, this is the way to do it. For these types of situations, I'm gonna tell you what's going on in the States. They have numerous products. They've been using them for a number of years. They have either glyphosate in them or a massacre. They apply them over water. They're safer over water use. There have been numerous studies on them. And they can also apply from a helicopter. 
and they're spending a lot of money. They're investing a lot of money to restore their wetlands, their coastal wetlands. And they're looking north of the border and saying, what are you guys doing? Legal options in Canada. We have two products that are legally available to use on frame whiteys in Canada. Weathermax, Vision Max. They both have glyphosate in them, which is great. They both have a surfactant in them, which means you should not put it over water. This surfactant is harmful to aquatic life. So, nothing for overwater use. Uh, Vision Match can be a spray, uh, spray from the air. I know of one coastal wetland down at Long Point that got approval to use this to try and control fried muddies. It's not appropriate. They had the setback of 20 meters from the edge of their, well, wherever there was water. It's a coastal wetland. And it was, it was uh, a waste of their money. Um, as you probably know, we have a cosmetic pesticide ban in this province, which is great. Glyphosate is on that list. You have to be a licensed pesticide applicator to use uh, um, these products. And if you're working on privately owned land, so if you're not working with the Conservation Authority or Ministry of Natural Resources, you have to receive a letter of opinion from the Ministry of Natural Resources to apply your herbicide on land. And back to that, do the most good the least harm, there is a timing issue with when you should be applying or could be applying. And the birds will nest on the edges of frag. Even in ditches, they'll nest. So we shouldn't be going in um, in the spring or early summer. Um, just <coughs> have an awareness of, of the wildlife usage of these edges. Lake levels, this is how we're able to do what we're doing. We have to wait for the lake levels to drop. So I know all of you are saying we want them up. <laughs> 2012, I was happy in the sense that we could get into areas that we never could get into before, but as I mentioned, as fast as we were controlling, it was spreading elsewhere, so double-edged sword. I don't recommend the injection method. I was asked to do this for Salvo Beach years ago. Um, hand wicking works. If you're in a situation where it's windy all the time, it's a great way to apply uh, the herbicide strictly to the plants. This is uh, one method we're using to get in areas where it's really sensitive. We'll put the, the equipment on a boat, and we'll come into shore and we'll haul it all in and put up the ladder and spray. Or the backpack, we'll walk in and, and backpack spray. These areas here are a species at risk. If you can um, get into an area, and, and we don't use this equipment very often actually. This is what we're using to control a fried weedies and coastal wetlands right now. Um, this is Frank Laterno, and that's there and driving. These are retrofitted centaurs, track vehicles. It gets us into where we need to go to spray the frag up top, put seven feet up in the air, and everything's self-contained. There's areas we still can't get into. It's dangerous for us. It's dangerous. It's hard on the equipment. We get stuck. The tracks fall off. It's not appropriate in some situations. In some situations, we need to be able to apply this herbicide from the air. What we also found doing this work was uh, if we can get rid of that standing dead biomass after the chemical has killed what's below ground, killed all those uh, rhizomes and roots, uh, it really helps uh, with uh, the situ situation with the plants to restore. And even if we can't burn, if we can just roll it on the ground, the native plants can come up because it breaks it down quicker. Um, and the turtles can, we've heard from the turtle researchers that the turtles will bask on it. There's a, there's a snake using it to get its lunch. 